So uh, what, what I'm going to be talking about is a, is a new paradigm in space physics, uh, space research. But before I, I start that, le let me just tell you, what, I, I, I come from a traditional liberal arts university in the US. This is Johns Hopkins. And many of you might recognize it because we played a better Harvard than Harvard in, in the social network. They, they did all the filming at, at Hopkins. But, uh, uh, but this is, is the traditional way of academic research. Many of us come from this tradition. And I, I personally feel that it's very important to have a place where one can do research that's completely useless. So the, the yesterday I, I heard about uh, a, a guy who uh, uh, looked at cockroach antennae. Apparently con cockroach antennae get uh, all gunked up. They produce a wax and uh, the wax settles on their antenna and the cockroach clean it by passing the antenna through their mouth. I, I realize this is just before lunch. But anyway, <laughs> the, 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 so it cleans the antenna before, before uh, I mean after, after every, every so often. And so he wanted to find out why. And he put up a little, uh, you, know, you know the shields that they use for dogs to keep dogs from biting casts and things like that? He did a little thing like that, a little foghorn for the antenna. And he stopped the cockroach from cleaning the antenna. And he found that indeed the cockroach antenna got completely waxed up. And because cockroaches smell by using their antenna, he, he, the, they couldn't smell anymore with, with, with that. So this is research that no one will ever use, but, but it's interesting. It teaches us something about cockroaches, perhaps more than anyone ever wants to know. <laughs> and that's what the traditional university system allows you to do. Not just art, not just sciences, but also arts. And unfortunately, in India, we don't appreciate that, from, from including my parents, who, who never wanted me to go into physics. They wanted me to go into medicine. Fortunately, the sight of blood makes me sick. So, so I didn't actually do that. But, but I know all of, your, all of your parents will have wanted you to go into engineering or medicine or whatever. And, and uh, up, to, up to our HRD minister who, who wants to have technical colleges, not liberal arts universities. No one cares about the arts or humanities. But I think it's important. Is it, it's, even though Shakespeare's been dead and gone for 400 years, it's important to, to understand the, uh, the context. Now science is, okay, so universities are expensive, okay? Uh, liberal arts universities in the U.S. are even more expensive. It was much cheaper when I went, but, uh, but, but nevertheless expensive. Now this is the Hubble Space Telescope. At a conservative estimate, it's cost $5 billion. So it's a lot of money. The best science in the world, the best astronomy has come from this Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, astronomy has advanced in leaps and bounds but it's still expensive. And in a competitive world <coughs> where we have to fight for every, every dollar that we get, it's not easy to justify missions costing $5 billion. And a, a tradition has grown up around, uh, I'm sorry, did I miss a slide? No. Okay, so a tradition has grown up around, uh, uh, say, let's say, citizen science. From the time that I, I started my academic career, science was done only in, in universities. Now, more and more, science is being done, or sci science is able to be done at the amateur level. And so that uh, is Hanny Van Arkel, and she discovered that odd green-shaped thing just by looking through data in uh, Galaxy Zoo. And, uh, and, and so it's a way for, for, for everyone to get involved in science. And this is a function of faster computers, a much better internet, and a change in the mindset where we now have the, have the uh, understanding that we have to communicate our results to the public. Unfortunately, we're fighting for that mind space with people like uh, astrologers and you know, 2012 uh, disaster freaks and all, all these crazy people. So, so the amount of information, you, you, you have to, you have to uh, filter through the amount of information. But nevertheless, science is getting, more, is getting spread out more. And these are some high school students who published results in our flagship journal, 
the, the Astrophysical Journal. Space access is also getting much easier. And so this is Felix Baumgartner, who was sponsored by Red Bull. Of course, the, the, the uh, caption is a little unfair because he didn't exactly go to space. He went to the high altitude balloon at 40 kilometers. But nevertheless, the point is, is that, uh, is that in a way, this is democratizing science. His flight was very expensive. Red Bull paid quite a lot for it, uh, you know, hot, fancy cameras. And uh, the, the guy actually went through the sound barrier. So that, that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, intense. Now, when space flight started, or when, space, when the space age started, things were done on a fast scale and a, and a very uh, uh, proactive scale. So Sputnik was 1957. The space age started with Sputnik. It was only 12 years later that Neil Armstrong, who died about uh, six months ago and was my, my personal hero, he, he was responsible for my interest in space as well as, uh, as many other people of my generation. Many people got into space science because of Neil Armstrong. But it was only 12 years later that he landed on the moon. And this is inconceivable these days to go from uh, uh, Sputnik to landing on the moon in 12 years, it's just not possible. This is uh, the Orion spacecraft, which was uh, George Bush's idea to replace the space shuttle. He first announced it in 2004, and then because of various budget cuts, uh, and who knows what will happen when the uh, budget debate goes on, uh, is it today or tomorrow in the US? They have to cut, I don't know, 20% uh, or whatever it is. And uh, uh, so the original Orion spacecraft was, was scrapped in 2008, I think. No, the, he started in 2004. He was supposed to, they were supposed to develop this new Orion capsule by 2008, four years later. Well, it's 2013 now. The original proposal has all gone away. Now they have some new concept. And still, there's no US manned space capability. The, the, uh, they're developing on the private companies like uh, SpaceX. <coughs> this, is, uh, uh, this is this guy, who uh, Dennis Tito, who's planning to, s planning to send a couple out to Mars and back. I, I wasn't sure about that in, at the beginning, but, but they are planning to come back. So he wants, uh, if, if uh, anyone's interested, you're all not eligible because he wants a middle-aged couple who know how to live together because they figure that <laughs> space. Uh, if you kept abreast of the news, you'll, you remember that Strand One, which is the British company that's doing the same thing, went up on the PSLV, I think, two or three days ago. So they, they sent a, a phone into space. And phones are cheap. Everyone's got a phone. But one of the things that makes astronomy difficult is that you need size. And this is the uh, telescope. It's a six meter mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope, it's huge. If you're going to carry something like that up into space, you need a, a big launch vehicle. You need, a, a, you need all the resources to make something that big, so many people and so on. So it's going to be expensive. And there's nothing you can do about that. The same thing with something like the LHC, the uh, 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 Large Hadron Collider. It's big. There's nothing you can do. It's going to be expensive. In order to do the real frontier work, you have to spend money. And there's, there's not, no way around it. And it's just a matter of whether society thinks it's important enough to, to expand the boundaries of knowledge, or whether we're, we, we would rather have a, a, a new Apple iPhone. So it's, it's up, to, up, to, up to you all as taxpayers. But what, uh, what we can do is we can do space astronomy if we focus on the right areas. And so that's, uh, where, that, that's where I'd like to, uh, to, to spend the remaining few minutes of, of my talk, which is that, that uh, uh, as long as our goals are modest enough, we're not trying to see to the ends of the universe. As long as our goals are modest enough, as long as our equipment is, uh, as long as we can do it with equipment that's reasonably, reasonably uh, priced, reasonably sized, then it's possible for us to do things cheaply. 
So uh, KISS is another old space term. It, stan it stands for keep it simple, stupid. Uh, you know, don't, don't do anything complicated. So what do we do? We use off-the-shelf hardware. If we can use an Android phone, great. We can use an Android phone. You know, now uh, 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 you, can use, uh, you can use the wireless capability on your phone so that you don't need all these huge wires. You don't need this harness to talk between your phone and the, and, and the computer. You can do it over wireless. Do it over Bluetooth, do it over, uh, over the, uh, uh, the, 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 the regular wireless, whichever. Uh, other things are, are very cheap. GPS units are cheap. Unfortunately, there's a military requirement that stops you from using GPSs over 17 kilometers. That makes it expensive because of ICBMs. They don't want ICBMs to be able to track. But as if you're willing to pay a little extra and go through some extra bureaucratic hoops, you can even get GPS units that, that work out in space. So there are a lot of things that you can do cheaply, that you can do, uh, 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 th that you can do for a low cost. As long as you're imaginative enough and as long as your goals are modest enough. So what we're doing now is we, we're, we're doing a lot of balloon flights. So it's, we would be doing a lot of balloon flights if it were easier to get uh, permission from, from our authorities. So we, we've been working for one year. It took DGCA about uh, eight months to give us permission and then it took the various airports another four months to give permission. So now our permission expires in the end of June <laughs> and uh, uh, hopefully it'll be easier the second time round. But, uh, but what we're trying to do is, uh, you may have heard of Comet Ison which is uh, going to come by in uh, uh, October, November. And it's supposed to be the comet of the century. No one really knows yet because comets are, are, are odd things. But it's going to go, it's a sun grazing comet, so it goes, may even go right through the sun, through the outer atmosphere of the sun. And when it does that, because it's a new comet, it's likely to be really bright, and it may even be visible in the daytime, a daytime comet. And we want to launch a balloon, which is no one else is going to be able to do this. We want to launch a balloon to, uh, to observe that comet. So our balloons, we're, we're using uh, balloons, local balloons, 2 kg balloons, meaning they lift 2 kgs. Those balloons cost uh, a few thousand rupees, four or five thousand rupees. Our uh, uh, spectrograph, because we want to take spectra, to so that we can observe the various lines. That costs a little more, about three lakhs per spectrograph. If we were just flying a Nikon camera, then of course it's much cheaper. But, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to simply launch something for the sake of launching something. Or at least I don't. I want to do some, uh, that, that's an engineering thing. I want to do things, because I'm, I'm a physicist, I want to do the science. So I want to get science out of this. So what uh, we're planning to do is, uh, is the spectrograph, take, spect take a spectrum of the comet in the ultraviolet, which I can do from 35, 40 kilometers up, fly the balloon, get it back, uh, then, then we, we've got unique data that no one else has done before. And we want to have a continuing series of balloon flights where we keep on developing the, the hardware and where we pick these niche areas of science that no one else can do. It's very hard for many telescopes to observe bright stars. Just because the telescopes are big, they collect too much light, and the detectors are too sensitive. This is something that's perfect for us. We can observe the moon, we can observe Jupiter, can do anything. Uh, eventually, what we'd like to do is to get out into space, because uh, 200 kilo 600 kilometers is better than 40 kilometers. And uh, there what uh, we can try doing is using shared launches. There are a lot of uh, colleges which fly nanosats. Again, nanosats are not interesting to me because they don't do any science. But if I can get uh, maybe 10 kg, 20 kg, use a shared launch with, uh, uh, with, with many other satellites, that might bring the price to a, to a point where I can afford. Uh, not me personally, but where I can afford. And so, uh, uh, let me, let me end my talk there, just saying that, uh, that this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to start a new paradigm in space astronomy where we can have fast, quick launch, uh, fast launches that are cheap enough that we don't have to go through hoops and struggle, uh, uh, you know, things to, to, to get. 
if I try to get a hundred crores from the government, that's difficult. It takes me ten years to do it, and I don't have ten years. But if I if I try to get five lakhs, that's reasonably easy. And of course, I'm not supposed to ask for money from anyone here. But you know, if <laughs> if anyone wants a balloon of their own, please feel free to contact me afterwards. I'll, I'll take checks. So so let me end here. <laughs>